Uh, and if I told you that, I have to kill you, so I can't tell you that one. Okay, well, I don't, I don't want to die today. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I'd send my assassin, so I wouldn't actually physically kill you myself. But yeah. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. All right, so my guest today is Brady Ryan with the uh, San Juan Island Sea Salt Company. Brian, Brady, welcome to the show, and don't mind me laughing. Thank you. So it's an honor to be here, and uh, I don't care how you introduce me. I'm, I'm happy to be here chatting it. Awesome. So I would like you to just kind of go back through your origin of how you got started doing sea salt. Yeah. But also, you had mentioned you're a lifetime resident of the islands, San Juan's? That's right, Is yeah. That- Okay, yeah. so I hit the, let's, the, let's let's hear it. I hit the universal jackpot, you know, just being born on San Juan Island. It's uh, anybody lives in the Northwest knows what that's like, and uh, to be there anyway to see it. And uh, yeah, I was born and raised here. I was the last uh, baby scheduled to be born on the island. They used to have a hospital that did births here, and I was the last one scheduled. Um, wow. Yeah, and then grew up here. Just had a great childhood, and lived right on the ocean, and went to University of Washington. Kind of fell in with my tribe uh at the botany greenhouse down there i realized i didn't realize before but i realized then that i was a, p- a plant person uh, you know something about being in the dirt learning about plants it just fired me up and uh you know at where we are in our world right now when you start getting involved with plants and farming you immediately start thinking about local food i was kind of this the hot thing like oh can you eat more locally than we are now we don't need to eat from the whole world but could you just eat from right here and washington's kind of a bread basket so it kind of works with that um and so I was in that vein, taking classes related to that, you know, kind of it's just thinking about agriculture and food and sustainable agriculture and all that. And, um, yeah, it was an article, shoot, I don't know if it was a Severe magazine or what it was, maybe just a Seattle times. And a couple was trying to say, okay, we're going to do a local Thanksgiving and we're going to make sure everything's within a hundred mile thing. I think that was a book, like the hundred mile oh. diet. Um, this was 2009, something like that. And, um, yeah. And they said that we went out and gathered seawater and we boiled it and we made sea salt. That, so that went on our Turkey and that image struck what stuck with me because I spent so much of my childhood was in that ocean, whether it's fishing or crabbing or going on just inordinately long swims in the ocean, just dangerously long swims with my friends. Uh, it just flows in my blood. And so the idea of making salt was like, that's, I got to try that. So yeah, coming home that, that year, that Christmas 2009, probably my best buddy's home visiting his folks because we grew up together and it's like, okay, you're doing it with me. So we go out to this huge beach on the island and it's just stormy weather. It's like, you know, 30 degrees, raining, winds going sideways. And he goes out there into the chest high surf, collects five, 10 gallons of seawater in his igloo. And uh, I got a picture of him. It's, I mean, it's hilarious. He's dressed in like a, you know, it's a snow jacket out there collecting the seawater. And we bring it home. So wait, wait, I got to interrupt you. How did yeah. he have to, how, how'd you make him go out there? How did you <laughs> go out there? I think that says more about our relationship than anything else. Uh, okay. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know I, I, yeah that's a good question how did i i was the one staying dry and taking the picture but uh yeah anyway. I just, how'd you i just you, <laughs> yeah no it's uh we gotta examine that one in therapy session i think me and him but uh, anyway we brought this stuff home and it's just you know seawater whatever it is what it is and we put it on a pot he had a pot in his parent in his mom's house and i had a pot in my dad in my parents house and uh like okay let's give this a shot and it turns out it's it just takes forever i mean you would be surprised how long it takes to boil away a five gallon. Yeah, how, long, to to, how long did that first batch take? I, you know, it was, again, it's been about 10 years, but it was at least four or five hours. I mean, it was a long time and, and a oh, boiling vat, a vat of seawater it is, it makes a huge mess because it's just spitting out steam all over the kitchen and it's like salty steam. So everything's just getting crusted, ruining. I think I probably ruined that pot of my mom's <laughs> and uh, just a salt film over the whole kitchen. But at the end you get this, like you get down there, you start seeing crystals uh, it's popping up, you know, in that last little inch of water and and then eventually you get this little slurry it's like a slurry it's not really dry crystals it's a slurry so we dried that in the oven and i don't know maybe i got three jars <laughs> gave a few to family members and uh one to a girl i liked at the time and and uh you know called it a fun novelty and so that was the beginning of my my salt making experience but it took a few years before after that before the idea started to gave a little more steam in my head because i've been working on so graduated university of washington math major, nothing related to plants, nothing related to agriculture, just a nerdy math guy. But I realized it through that experience that I was, that plants were my soul. I mean, it's like being in the dirt, but farming, making food, that was, that brought me, brought me, brought me life. So, uh, immediately went and started working $500 a month 
farm, <laughs> vegetable farming job outside the city. So took my very valuable education and turned it into a $500 a month farming job. And, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. In retrospect, I probably should have just gone straight to the farm, but <laughs> um, regardless, anyway, we're building, we're growing vegetables out there in Duval, Washington, um, really high quality organic vegetables and learned a ton about that amazing industry. And, but part of that industry is building lots of greenhouses because around here, we don't have the kind of weather that grows basil and tomatoes and peppers, all the things we want to grow that want a little more heat. So yeah, I got a lot of experiment experience building greenhouses and uh, just kind of seeing how magical they are for extending seasons and making crops possible that were not otherwise possible. And then, so this is 2012 and uh, I don't know if you remember, but 2012 was supposed to be the end of the world. You remember that? I vaguely, I saw that on your website and I was like, and I, I hadn't gone back to research that yet. Yeah, so yeah. What was the, what was, the, what was it about 2012 that, you know, why was it going to end then? And, yeah. you know, I, wish, I mean, I, I don't know. I never really looked into it. It was that Mayan calendar thing. It was like, oh, that's right. Yeah, had done the, the calculations uh, based yes. on the Mayan calendars that this is, okay, it's supposed to end here. And Nostradamus right. maybe one of his predictions, regardless, I thought it was all BS. It didn't matter, but I was like, this is a good excuse to try to like tr- turn it into kind of an extra fun special year. Um, so part of that was like just going to Europe on a whim, like me and my friends just like over overnight, we decided we're going to Europe and we went on, blew all our money going to Europe and then, okay, we ran out of money then go back to work and then um, went skydiving on a whim and, you know, just small stuff like this to try to like seize the day a little bit. And um, on that trip to Europe, I think it was, yeah, my, my girlfriend at the time was working with me at the farm. She, she, right before then she had showed me right before or after she had showed me a YouTube video of a gentleman in Maine making sea salt in greenhouses and I had been imagining something like this. I've been imagining, okay, I know how to build greenhouses. I, I know that to make salt, you need to get rid of a bunch of water. And, so, and then the salt the crystals are left behind. And I don't want to boil it because that was a nightmare. And I was like, okay, could you have some kind of small little two-foot evaporation tent, put some water underneath there, and then the water would go away and the salt would left it left behind. So I was kind of brewing on this. And then at that same time on this flight, my girlfriend showed me uh, this YouTube video, a gentleman in Maine, Maine sea salt. And he's like, making sea salt in greenhouses. And there was no, there's no, you know, boiling, there's no fans, there's no heaters and nothing. It's like, this is my kind of thing. This is like, oh, natural. And, um, and I was like, I know how to build the greenhouse. Uh, my parents, you know, live two miles from the water. We're doing this. So 2012 again, it's like, why not try to start a sea salt thing? So August of 2012, I get, I can, you know, conscript every single one of my friends to come up and build this thing for no dollars. And Perfect. yeah, so we're all building this greenhouse and then we get one batch of water in there and it's like, august so it's like right at the end of summer and we need the sunshine to do this thing obviously but it worked and the whole thing just fills with salt i mean it's just amazing it's like all of a sudden a month later it went from seawater to 300 pounds of salt and uh yeah went to uh university district farmers market in seattle there that first first two months later and people loved it i don't know it was like we we didn't know what we were doing we, it was not a good salt it was too wet it was too coarse it was too all this but it was so novel, you know, there's sea salt. Wow. Sandwich down sea salt. Okay. This is cool. And we tried to put it in a nice jar and, uh, people respond really well to it. We made 700 bucks that first day and it's like, okay, maybe there's something here. And we built another three greenhouses the next year and then another three the next year and haven't worked for anybody else since we just keep on growing. And, and, uh, yeah, it's been a fun ride to be a part of. So how, how, what size are these greenhouses? So, uh, these? they are 12 by a hundred feet. So each one's 1200 square oh. feet. And, uh, I put in around 1500 gallons or so of seawater. And again, it only happened during the summer because we're relying on the sun. We're not doing anything and there's no added energy here. Um, about a month later on average, it turns into about 250 pounds of pure white gold. So how, all right. So the bottom of the greenhouse is kind of a, a, a mini pool, if you will. Yeah. I mean, how, yes. how, how deep, okay. So you've got this hundred foot long by 12 pool. Yes. How deep is that? Yeah. So uh, inside the greenhouse, we build up a, a raised pond, uh, kind of like a big kiddie pool. I mean, it's it's not very deep. It's, oh boy, maybe six to seven inches deep at its deepest. Okay. Maybe not even that. Maybe it's like four or five. And uh, because obviously the deeper you make it, the harder it is to heat up. Uh, I mean, you could put 10,000 gallons in there, but maybe you wouldn't get a batch even done in a whole summer. So you need to put in an appropriate amount so that that can actually heat up to the start evaporating. Um, so yeah, it's just a little raised up kiddie pool. It's on black, uh, food grade, you know, it's pot of water grade plastic. And, uh, it's just as low tech as you can get. And, uh, but it's, it's miraculous to watch it every, every, it's, I mean, I've done through hundreds of these batches now and every time, you know, so it's, like I said, it takes about a month, about three weeks in, you start to see little crystals 
flecking the top of the the water and then then they turn into upside down pyramids and then uh then they start turning into squares stacked on squares in the bottom and this is still while there's while there's still water there and then uh you see arrow shaped ones and stuff that looks like little snowflakes and just everything you can imagine i mean the diversity of huh. crystals i see every single time is it, it, it's astounding and i think people picture salt they picture morton and they picture minuscule little microscopic you know everything's the same uh salt cubes like every single one's exactly the same and that with morton's it is that way um but salt doesn't grow that way naturally it's just like kind of a wild process and uh, uh the crystallization it just kind of it fires me up every single time still to this day so yeah so after the the water is evaporated now when you did this on the stove you had kind of a slurry so you had to put yes. it in the oven yes does this what do you have to do to finish this off here or does it, is it completely finished in the greenhouse? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, if you let it sit in there baking, baking, baking in the sun of the greenhouse, this is baking with solar energy. That is, um, it would get very dry and you could get it, you know, it's totally usable, but again, we're talking, it, it's been allowed to grow. So salt natural. I mean, if you allow it to grow, it'll grow into, you know, agglomerations the size of your hand. Um, oh. yeah, so they're huge. They're way too big for us to use. So, um, it, we do a whole bunch of different steps to it at that point, but you know, it's like trying to pull out, there's some flaky stuff in there. So flake salt is a very special product. It's um, kind of like light, delicate pieces that look great, but they dissolve in your mouth. So we have a way of extracting those pieces out. And then we have some big chunky pieces. We extract those out for our grinders and we have some tiny pieces. And we extract those for uh, our blends. And then that medium stuff is perfect for our natural salt. So we just, we're kind of like sifting, uh, drying, grinding. We don't really add anything else to it. Um, to finish it off, it's just kind of pulling out the different types of crystals. But uh, yeah, it's, I mean, you could use it. You could just take a scoop in your hand and eat it right there off the, off the pond, of course, as well, though. How, well, how do you sift through this? I mean, is this by hand? Is this a mechanized process? Uh, no, no, somewhere between. Or is this proprietary and we're not going to talk about it? Or? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no, it's somewhere between, we are a very low tech business. Uh, so don't pitch your big machinery. This is like a, uh, um, the, the, like the equipment we use to, to grind it still to this day is 14 cup, uh, Cuisinart food processors. Uh, oh, wow. okay. yeah. right. you know, I've used it. I mean, I use it the first year and it's like, we're, st we, we just beat the crud out of these machines, but they, they do the job. And, um, and then we use like big commercial sifters and stuff. And then we do, um, yeah, do we do one kind of fancy step that allows us to pull out the, the flake salt. Uh, and if I told you that I have to kill you, so I can't tell you that one. Okay. We're, I don't, I don't want to die today. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I, I'd send my assassin. So I wouldn't actually physically kill you myself, but yeah, I, I, not today. Not today. So. Tomorrow. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, so sorry, folks, no, no, no trade secrets here. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a super simple process. Like I said, I came into this from a farming standpoint, so I'm kind of like, um, I'm not a fancy food guy. I'm not even like a business guy. I just like working in the dirt and working hard. And so there's ways we could improve our business um, in terms of like using just the right mach machinery or like maybe adding a fan on the end or whatever. But I don't know, to me, it's kind of like farming still. It's like I put that seawater in there and that's like my seed and then the sun hits it and it does its thing. And I go in there and I just, you know, it's, it's a Herculean effort to get that salt out of there. Cause you're talking about 300 pounds of hot, wet salt in a greenhouse. that will get to about 125 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of the summer. Um, so, I mean, it's like working in a, in a, in a coal mine, and uh but i love it i mean that's that's like uh, my body i was born on this earth to be to go harvest salt in a hot greenhouse so it works for me <laughs> how many how many harvests can you make in a greenhouse in a year yeah i mean or is that just one no no not just or, one uh okay. four, four minimum five maximum so okay. um you know things are changing global warming uh will make our business easier if anything because there's gonna be more warmer weather in theory um, but so like we start on average, we'll start, we'll put our first batch of seawater in around April and those ones take a lot longer because it's still, it's still wet out. Uh, you get some sunny days, but some rainy days too. Um, and those ones might take a, a month and a half, but then come July and August, those ones will finish in like three and a half weeks. Uh, uh so like I said, it's, uh, maybe a little over a month on average and we hope to get four batches out of every greenhouse every year. So we have 14 of these big long things right now. 14. So that'll be about 14,000 pounds of the natural, the raw natural product. We're going to be trying to make this coming year. And I mean, every year we've more, we've basically sold out of every single drop we've made. The demand for it has been insane and it keeps going up. So we're just going to keep making more. That's great. Yeah. How do you, so you guys are not right on the, on the 
coastline. So yeah. you're, you're bringing the you're bringing the seawater in. Yeah, yeah. I got it all. Um, I got it all. Is your friend going in <laughs> with his parka yeah. in the igloo, he, or he, he modernized that process? No, you know he he hasn't stopped since day one. I've just been out there doing these harvests by hand. <laughs> he needs therapy. Yeah, he, he does. Therapy. Yes, masseuse too. You know that'd be good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, uh, no, I I got this. Um, I got this truck. I think it's about 50 years old now. I got it, bought it from a gentleman on the island for 1500 bucks. And it's just this old, you know, it's a truck you see, it'll be like in a movie, you know, it's like got so much character and it's a big old flatbed truck, but it's, it's just got big old eyes on it. And so I call it Fred and I put a big old tank on the back and we drive two miles to a, a gentleman who's got this beautiful private beach and he lets us just back our truck up, fill it with seawater. And I drive back down to the farm. So I'll do that, you know, trip so a bunch I- of times in the summer and yeah. Okay. Go ahead. What were you going to say? <laughs> I was going to ask how many trips Fred had to make. So, yeah. um, so how <laughs> yeah. do you, so it's got a pump on it. You're just then sucking water out of the ocean into, yeah, the, exactly. into the tank on the truck. Okay. And then exactly right. it when you get to the, yeah. Okay. And we filter the crud out of it to, uh, you know, every, to, we filter it down to extremely small filter sizes, make sure that seawater going into our greenhouses is crystal clear. And, uh, yeah, it comes out and then we get this bright, hot, white, beautiful crystal salt. Yeah. There's a photograph on your website with, I th- somebody in the greenhouse with a shovel yeah and it's kind of they got the shovel kind of at an angle so you can see the salt and yeah, yeah. it was it was pure white i was i yeah. was um quite shocked yeah frankly. totally it's i mean i i we'll get to this maybe a little later but i really want more than anything to keep to find a way to share this the magic of this process with people we're not open to the public yet we just don't have a problem i'm doing this all on my parents farm they have a beautiful 40 acre farm they let me do it but it's not conducive to like oh the the throngs of tourists come down and see what we do but are you know moving towards that finding our own place because it, it is it is really cool to see i mean it's like most people have never pictured what how is it the salt is made and the way we make it is very odd in the world of salt i mean it's extremely odd but um yeah it's just kind of picturesque and unique and otherworldly the the things we get to do during the summer so uh yeah anyway it's just uh, i feel blessed to be able to be a part of it it sounds like well, other than being in a 120 degree greenhouse with a shovel in, no, that doesn't sound good to me, but I'm glad you like it. It's like hot yoga. You know, it's like, people do that. <laughs> people pay for that. Yeah. yeah. That's what you could do. That's, that's your, your agritourism thing is turn it into hot yoga yes. Yes. and convince them that the, the flat shovel that yeah. they need to haul out is yeah. the thing to burn the, yeah, perfect. I mean, people pay for those boot camps, you know, the booty boot camps. <laughs> this is the salt boot camp. You come work for a couple of days, you, you shed 20 pounds. <laughs> there you go. So there you go. We've, we've just added a new line for your company. Done. Awesome. So, all right. So you've started this thing and it's growing yeah. and here we are in 2021 yeah. and you're putting new greenhouses in every year. Yeah. How many people work here at your company? Now, this? Let's see. My brother was my first employee and he's still here with me. Um, and now we got two other full-time yeah, I'd say about four full time people, you know, me and four other full time people and okay. hoping to grow that, hoping to hire another person this year. And uh, yeah, we just have a blast. It's just like we're kind of like family. We all grew up here on the island. Uh, we all have a very strong connection to the place. So when we when I send one of my employees to the farmer's market, for instance, I know they're coming from a place of love with the with the product and the place. And so it's just easy to sell. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and we keep adding more and more products because, you know, sea salt is the beginning of what we do, but we learned early on that we actually have a real knack for coming up with seasonings using our sea salt as the base. And then all sorts of unique concoctions. Like we have a, a kimchi salt and a sriracha salt and a, um, a dill pickle salt and all these really, really unique combinations. So those are all my brother, Tyler. He's kind of the master of flavors. I'm the, the grunt, whatever grunt labor. I'm going to hover some sea salt and he's doing the fine, the fine tuning stuff. So, okay. Yeah. So your salt, do you guys sell there's because there's a farmer's market on at Friday Harbor, yeah. if I remember. Yeah, yeah, there right. is. Yeah. So are you guys there regularly? Is that a place that people can? Oh, yeah. I know I, we'll, we'll come or we'll circle around to a lot of other places. Yeah, but yeah. Are you guys regulars at that farmer's market? Yeah, we had for sure. Yeah. In 2013, we started there. I mean, because this was my home farmer's market. We, we were going to do this one for sure. And it's been a great. We love it there. It's super cute little market. It's not as, you know, if you've only been to Seattle farmer's markets or like say, California farmers markets is not it's not as dense and like the stands aren't as as like filled with the most amazing veggie you've ever seen. But it's just a great little mm-hmm. small town farmers market and uh we do really well there because the tourists come up and our product is really well suited to kind of what we call like a foodie souvenir, basically. Um 
and we love it. We skipped all our farmers markets last year. I was just out of an abundance of caution. It's like, I, I didn't know it was early on. We didn't really know what the deal was with this thing. So we're like, I'm not gonna put any of my employees in the situation I wouldn't be comfortable doing. Um, and we had the ability to, you know, pull back from any kind of customer facing situation. So we skipped all of them. And then our website just went absolutely bananas last year. Like I think a lot of people's websites went bananas. And so it more than made up the difference. And so thankfully we were able to keep going, keep trucking without having to put my employees in any kind of situation. So let's suspend the COVID thing. So in, in a perfect world, there's no COVID. Yeah, of course. Okay. That's okay. So what far, what other farmers markets would you guys regularly be at? Bar, B- Ballard and U district. Yeah. So the two mainstays okay. in Seattle. Yeah. But uh, okay. honestly, skipping them last year, it kind of woke me up to, it's tough. I mean, we're in Friday Harbor. So either, I either got to ship product down to somebody um, or send one of my employees down and I just maybe rethink it. Um, that I think we might not go back to those Seattle markets. We might just stay real local with the Friday Harbor one because it's our baby. And, uh, and then just go all wholesale and online. And, um, mm-hmm. I hate doing that. I, I mean, I did the Ballard and you just farmers markets for years for like six, seven years. I love them. I love all the mm-hmm. vendors. I love the atmosphere, everything, but, uh, it's just a long ways for us to go. So yeah, stuff. Uh, yeah you've got a, that's a long drive. Yeah. Boat ride. Yeah. Yeah. Waiting in line. Yes. All the whole thing. Yeah. Yes. Logistically. I can. Yes. And it worked out fine when, when me and my wife didn't have kids, but now that we got like a one and a three year old, it's like the, the idea of going down on the weekend to do those things. is kind of a nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this whole, I, I kind of, before we go on to some of your products and yeah. all that, I, I, I am, I'd love to, as much as I don't want you to send the assassins, but th- I, I'm curious about how you guys are sorting this stuff because I'm, tr- I'm wrapping my brain around. Okay. Table salt. Okay. Boom. It's boring. Yes. It looks the same as everything else. Yes. You see some sea salts available in various whole foods, places like that. Yes. It's a little different, but you're telling me big chunks, the size of your hand. Yes. And I'm scratching my head going, I haven't seen that before in my life. Cause I'm sheltered. Yeah. So how are you guys doing this? I mean, elaborate a little bit more. Yeah. Is it literally just a shovel shoveling it out like in that photograph on your website or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I can elaborate. That's fine. Uh, so, so yeah, we'll go a little narrow and then I'll kind of give you a step back of, to give you a sense for how those other salts are made for context, for instance. Um, but yes, the way we make it is as simple as it looks on our website. It, the water goes away. So you're starting off with that six inches of water in these ponds. After a month, right. it's basically gone. And so you look in there, it looks like a snow field. It looks like it's snowed in there. And you're looking at maybe, you know, a, a half inch to an inch layer of, like I said, every type of crystal you've ever seen. I mean, every agglomeration size, whatever. And then we just go in there, the big food grade push broom. And then that's the hardest part is pushing these things in the piles and then scooping it up with that shovel. And I mean, it, the, the salt is literally hot. It's hot to the touch. It's probably about 105 degrees. The salt is. Oh, wow. So you're touching it and it's burning your hand. So anyway, but we're scooping it up and then we put it into buckets with holes in it. Uh, so there's draining because there's liquid. It doesn't, not every little bit of brine is finished there. Um, there's liquid that is still clinging onto it. So a little drain through that bucket uh, that'll dry it out a little bit. And then we put it on some racks uh, to air dry for about a week. Um, and then at that point we can we run it. Through, yeah. We run it through basically a, a series of sifters of different uh, mesh sizes. So we're getting big okay. crystals, small crystals, all the rest. And then we run it through, like I said, just that the Cuisinart uh, food processors <laughs> and that grinds it up nice. And uh, yeah, so there's no, no, no fancy magic or anything like that. It really is just a very simple yes. process. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm you... just, I'm, it probably would be better to be more complex, to be honest. But like I said, I'm just like, I'm a, I'm a farmer type. Well, I'm like, yeah, it seems to be working. So we're going to keep going with this. I mean, I, I'm looking at this photograph of there's a broom. Yeah. In the background and yeah, the little yeah. boy with the dog. Yeah. And I'm looking and your biggest problem with that is that the broom handle breaks and you go get a new broom <laughs> handle. It's not like it, you have to, all oh, the computer's down on yes. the, the thingamajig. Yes. So how long are these greenhouses good? F- I mean, the poles are going to last forever, yeah. but like, does, does the plastic get with all that salt and evaporation? Does that eat away at the plastic? No, Cause you were mentioning the kitchen was kind of a mess. So. Yeah. No, nothing what's, like, nothing like the that. The greenhouse is fine. The, the biggest problem is we live in a Valley cutting near the ocean where we get howling winds during winter. And so a real strong su- a winter storm can blow them up by which I mean the plastics torn to shreds, the skeleton mm-hmm. still fine. So we get that from time to time. We've just got to replace them. Um, but they're, they're good investments. I mean, even for farmers, they're good investments. They're cheap ways to extend your growing season and grow new things. And same for us. Um, 
Yeah, but I guess I want to just step, take, a, take a step back because just to think about the different types of salt, just give a little bit of context for your listeners for what they might be seeing. So, for instance, that Morton salt we talked about, when it rains, it pours, you know, the blue can, whatever, and those microscopic little cubes. So that could be sea salt. That can come from seawater. But eventually what has been done is put into an extremely complicated machine called a vacuum pan evaporator. Um, and extremely hot brine is being forced into the air, aerosolized into the air into an extremely hot, dry cavity. And then they're crystallizing instantaneously into perfectly tiny little cubes. So it's as technologically complex of a process as you can imagine. And it's refined to be pure sodium chloride. So NaCl, we all think of that as salt. But the ocean has all sorts of other, other minerals beyond just sodium and chloride. And, uh, we, so we wanted our salt to taste like the salt that you get when you're like, if you're a little kid and you're at the tide pool and you stick your finger in there and there's some, there's a little white crust on the tide pool. And we want, we want to taste like that. So it's briny, it's wild because there's a bunch of other minerals in the ocean that, um, that Morton's doesn't want in theirs. And even when you buy sea salt from Whole Foods, that's been refined down. I can go into depth on the process by which it's refined. It's kind of interesting, but regardless, it's refined down about 99% pure sodium chloride. And, um, yeah. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is, is do it in a low energy way. So like, for instance, a lot of, there's a lot of artisan salt made in, in the Northwest. Now there didn't used to be, when we started, there was almost none, but there's a lot of it made in Alaska and California and Oregon. And almost all of it is made by boiling seawater. Like I talked about how I started this on my parents' stove. Mm -hmm. So whether you're using propane or whatever you're using, but you're boiling and it can take about, as a rough estimate, it can take about a, a pound of fossil fuels to make one pound of sea salt. So you want one pound of sea salt, you got to burn a pound of propane. Um, it's an extremely energy intensive process. And so when we were starting this business, we were like, okay, we know that a lot of the artisan salt in the world, this is the fancy, like small business salt is made by boiling. And we're like, oh boy, that's not really why I got into this. And, uh, we can make, I mean, but, but if you do that, obviously you can make salt year round. You can make it just, you know, in any conditions, but we're like, okay, we're going to go this other route. And so we're one of the only artisan solar salt uh, uh, manufacturers on the West coast. And uh, there are big industrial ones, but, but we're the one of the only artisan ones. And we're like, no, nope, we're not gonna do any fans, no heaters, no boiling, no, nothing like that. We're just letting good old sunshine do the work, which means we obviously have a really small season, but uh, it just kind of makes sense for where the world is at. And, what we wanted to do with our business and uh yeah that's kind of our unique angle on doing this thing no i think that's awesome yeah. I, I really do i'm on your uh tasting notes yeah, yeah. And, I, and i'm looking kind of at the the photographs and so i'm kind of seeing kind of the shapes a little differently in your photographs yeah. so you have your natural sea salt yeah and then you have popcorn blend that was your next thing <laughs> yeah, I, was, yeah. I was just kind of I was like popcorn blend yeah so what was, when you started this, you started doing just sea salt, yes. but what, what was your next, was it popcorn salt was the next thing you guys I came up it, with? I, what was the next thing? I think the next one was when we called it San Juan blend. So it was an homage to the our island, obviously. And it's just kind of like standard garlic pepper, you know, all purpose seasoning, you use it on anything. And, and we still sell it to this day. It's one of our best sellers, but the popcorn one is, it's got a fun story to it because I don't know if you had this experience. Have you had nutritional yeast on popcorn? I have not. Okay. So it's kind of a hippie thing. Nutritional yeast, uh, for those listeners that do or may or may not know, is that yellow flaky stuff. It used to be only sold in health food stores, very niche niche product. <clears throat> Hippies loved it because you can make a lot of kind of vegany. It can kind of mimic cheese if you uh, use it in sauces and soups and everything. But I don't know. For whatever reason, our local movie theater here on Friday Harbor, uh, the Palace Theater, love it. <laughs> Can't wait to go back. Uh, they always would offer you nutritional yeast with the popcorn. And so it's like, you want a big dump of nutritional yeast? Yeah. So all the island kids were like, yeah, you got to have nutritional yeast on popcorn. That's a no brainer. It's not just butter and salt, but you got to have that nutritional yeast because it has this like lovely umami, uh, savory thing. That's just like, unlike anything else. Okay. So we had that in mind because we grew up with this stuff and the, all the off island kids are like, what are you putting on your popcorn? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what is that nasty stuff? You put yeast. What are you, what are you talking about? Bread yeast. What are, what? what are we talking here? Um, but I knew I needed to do something like with that because, uh, yeah, it's just part of how we grew up. And so we came up with a popcorn blend next, which is our sea salt, of course. And then you got nutritional yeast, which is, it's like yellow manna from heaven. Now, who knows how, how exactly it's made. It's a byproduct of the brewing process, but regardless, it's like this amazing stuff that's so packed with umami flavor. And then we got some herbs some garlic and dill and, uh, cayenne to round it out. And I don't know. I kind of just butts with it. And I was like, this is amazing. But then really quickly, we're like, we hardly ever make popcorn, but we put it on eggs. We put it on pasta. We put it on, uh, you know, avocado toast. We put it on everything. And it's like, well, we kind of got something good here. And so we started selling it. And 
and I, I think I'm, I, I haven't done finished my books for the for last year yet, but it's close to being our single best source of income is that popcorn blend. Wow. People buy it like crazy. I mean, we had a gentleman, um, I won't name him, but he's down in Portland for a while there. He was buying 12 to 15 jars a month for just for himself. This is not like a wholesaler. This is like just a, just a guy, <laughs> a guy for himself <laughs> was, was going through a jar every two days. I don't know if he was given to his family. I mean, he, okay. But well, think about that. 15 jars a month is a jar. I know, that's what I'm saying. I, we, we were all, <laughs> wow. every time you would order, we'd be like, what, what's going on? Like we we're trying to figure this mystery out. But regardless, all that, you know, long story short is, uh, people have really taken to the product. And, uh, I mean, nutritional yeast, it needs to be in more things. It's a magical ingredient and more food manufacturers need to use it. But we hit the gold mine with this popcorn blend and, uh, we saw it like crazy. We love it. Okay. So now this is the bus going to hit you. Cause this is a question you weren't prepared love for. It. I always love this question to ask people because it's actually kind of fun, I think. Yeah. And you might not, but I do. So when you guys were developing these products yeah. through the years, did you ever come up with something that you thought was going to be great and just wasn't? Like, oh, yeah. You know, you're like, oh, this was going to be, you know, whatever, da, 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 da. This is going to be awesome. Yeah. And it just, you couldn't make it right. Yes. That's a great question. It's a great question. Hmm. Dang. Yeah. The, the, the dustbin, I have such a short term memory, which is not good. I'm kind of like a dog. Well, actually, no, that is good yeah. because then you don't, re- no, seriously, you don't remember your failures. Yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah. That's a really good, I, that's a, I, I need to think more about that. Um, I, I wish I had a really snappy answer for you, but it's actually something I should that's talk okay. to my brother about because, uh, I think one, I just heard of Jeff Bezos quote and Jeff Bezos is, you know, whatever he is, what he is. But he said, it was talking about the fire phone and the fire phone was an absolute flop. And he's like, it came out, this was some number of years ago. And it's like, this thing sucked. Like everybody hated it. This is a terrible release. And he's like, you think that's a failure? We, that's nothing. We got so many way bigger failures coming down the road. And I was like, oh, that really struck me. I don't know if I'm making enough mistakes in this business. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe I'm not, we're not trying enough things to, you know, to fail. And so that's a good inspiration for that. But uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's, it's always funny to ask people like, okay, so you thought this was going to yes. be, because we've done some things on the website. We thought, oh, this is going to be great. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we were the only ones that thought that was a good idea. So let's yes, kill it yes, and move exactly. on. I think so, we, we, we do have one that's kind of a unique one, a sour salt. Um, it's, oh, yeah. it's just sea salt and citric acid. So I, I love sour. I've always been a sour guy. Sour Skittles, sour, you know, sour patch kids, whatever. Bruschetta, tomato bruschetta to me is one of my favorite things in the world. And that's of course the vinegar, the salt, the garlic, tomatoes, just the magical mix of all those things. And uh, so we wanted to make a salt that was already sour, ready to go. And I don't know if I just can't sell it or the name or what. We never sell it. I love it. I think it's a really unique, fun product. Uh, so it's not that the product doesn't work. We still love it, but uh, it never quite captured anybody's imagination. Um, so yeah, anyway. There's always things that are like my little babies, but not everybody else agrees. Okay. So sour salt yeah. is the one that maybe wasn't quite ready for the market yet. Yeah. You know, maybe, I, maybe, maybe my, my sales pitch is not right. I'm going to stick to that one. <laughs> I need to figure out a better okay. sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> What's the process like that you guys go through to create a new sea salt blend? Yeah. I mean, we see something we like. And does the, and, and let me, sorry, let me interrupt. No, no go back. Go so, and is there... When you're you, when you're making the salt, and you're not making the salt, but you know when the salt's presenting itself to you, are there things that you guys do that can change its inherent makeup? But you know, yeah, what is there anything that's going on there that you guys can do that's in changing its final whatever final? Yeah, yes, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. <Yeah. laughs> I know exactly what you mean. The words maybe weren't there, but I, I just can't say yeah. <laughs> words are hard. That's fine. No, I know exactly what you mean. It's something we're really, we're really trying to figure out because um, for instance, our best, the product that has the most demand for us is this flake salt because flake salt is for chefs. Flake salt kind of has this cachet of being this very fancy thing. Often they're pure metal, uh, but they don't have to be, um, but they're light, delicate kind of, they almost look like jewels, but, but they're not ch- They're not chunky. So you bite down on them. They just dissolve. They fall apart in your mouth. So it's this magical subset of salt crystals of what they won't naturally do. Um, and naturally we get maybe like 5% of our batches will be flake salt. 5%, okay. uh, not 5% of the batches, but 5% of each batch like this hanging out in there is flake salt. But so we're like, okay, this, but well, we're always running out. People really want it. So is there any way we could tweak this process um, to produce more of that? And long story short, we we don't know yet it's it's unclear i mean we could cool it down so we could open the doors wider for instance we get more airflow the temperature goes down 
Um, but you get more air flowing over knee over, over top with that speed things up. And would that help Would that slow things down? Um, there's a lot of different things we've tried in small ways, but the truth is we've just been selling the, the, the plain stuff so fast. And like, we, we can't keep up with the demand that we haven't had enough mm-hmm. time for experimentation yet, but it's a very, for us, it's like, that's the most interesting part of the job is like understanding more like this basic thing. Cause we want to be farmers. Right. And so this like, to be a good farmer, you got to know why does a beet grow fat in one part of the soil, one part of your farm and grow skinny in another part of your, your farm. Um, and this, that's the kind of stuff that we want to get into the nuts and bolts of, but, um, we've just been, it's, <laughs> we've been selling it so fast. We haven't had time to slow down and do some like experimentation, which is obviously it's a, it's a blessing, but, uh, Right. Yeah, bottom line, we're still kind of ignorant as to how the whole thing works. It, it just seems to work. You know, it's like we don't know why it go, comes out this way and it seems to be about a month, but for whatever reason, it works out and uh, keeps going. All right. We're going to come back to your product, but I'd like to shift gears over to the island. Yeah. You guys grew up there. Yeah. You've lived most of your lives there, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you went, to, you went away to college, but you came back. <laughs> Tell our listeners something about the San Juan Islands that they probably don't know that they should know. Yeah. Hmm. I think most people think of the islands as beaches. I mean, there's, there's some amazing beaches on here on the island. I mean, within within a 10 minute drive, you can get to five like world class beaches that are just open to the public. I mean, really true gems of Washington State. Um, hmm. And so you picture the island, you picture these beautiful beaches, but to me, some of the most magical parts of the island are the inner parts, the, the, the farmland. I mean, some of the most beautiful farmland, I, I've traveled in a lot of different farmlands around the world. And some of the most beautiful farm scenery I've ever seen is in the San Juan Islands. Um, and so I feel really lucky that we are a little salt farm, quote unquote, is in the heart of San Juan Valley, which is just this beautiful kind of beating heart of the agricultural areas of San Juan Island. And, uh, I mean, it's just, you get the mountains right there off in the distance covered in snow. And then you can kind of see a little bit of the ocean and there's something about getting the farm, the ocean, the mountains, all those in one viewpoint. It's just like, it's stunning in a way that words can't, can't quite do justice. But uh, yeah, I guess it would be, what, what would you say? It's just not, it's not just about the beaches. It's just, it's got so much more to offer than just beaches would be the one thing that uh, I'd encourage okay. listeners to think about. Yeah. So we all know that the summertime, the ferries are, you know, packed, you mm-hmm. get reservations. I mean, it's just bumper to bumper to get up. Yes. There. When's another good time to come up to the island? I've always felt it's changed a little bit over time, but I've always felt that after school starts, so what is this like, you know, September, mid to late September is like this golden mm-hmm. time because for one thing, the island's in more of a rain shadow than, than most of the, uh, the rest of the rain shadow. We're, so we're even a little drier. So, um, yeah, sometimes September is just sublime, absolutely sublime. And the traffic has gone way down. Uh, people are back in school. So if you're going to able to sneak away on a, on a weekday, even better. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, for, for most of us islanders, September is kind of the magic month when the craziness okay. has calm down a little bit, but you still get this, like every evening is just like something out of a, a movie, you know, in terms of that golden hour and everything like that. Um, right. so yeah, so I think, I mean, September things are changing though. I mean, as Seattle grows and becomes more affluent and more popular, the tourist season is expanding. Um, so maybe September is still hard to get, hard to get up here. I, to be honest, I, I, I haven't left the island much lately, so I don't really know, okay. but, um, yeah, but also I'm an I'm a, I'm a Pacific Northwest Island boy. So I mean, to me, going to a big old national park beach like we got here on the island in the middle of a windstorm, that's like, that's great too. So come out in December, rain and blowing sideways, go out to the beach and just let the elements just wreak havoc on you. That's that's life. I love that. So that'd be December. Or to send your friend out. Yeah, exactly. A, a, yes. A, an igloo of water. Yeah, okay. yeah. Abuse your friends and enjoy the weather. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So if you're not on the island, where would you go, where do you and the family like to go in the rest of the state? Is there any other places in the yeah, rest of the yeah, state? Because yeah, we're all about a Washington. Yeah, yeah, of course. Let's see. I mean, obviously, Seattle will always hold a place in my heart because I went to school there, went to university there, lived there for a long time. But outside of that, I've always loved um, Mazama area. Yeah. Something, oh, okay. yeah, something about the air there. I, I don't know what it is. I've been to other mountain areas, but the air is just like you can't help but breathe. And just like, as you feel your soul come alive, it's just like the most clean, crisp, 
pure air I've ever breathed. Um, so yeah, I, I, I absolutely love that Mazama twist, that whole region. And, uh, um, yeah, it's kind of magical. So that for me is if I was going to go to one spot, that'd be it. That'd be it. Okay. Awesome. All right. So let's come back to your products. Thanks for playing along with the Washington state. Oh yeah. I'm looking here. I'm looking at your, 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 uh, cooking inspiration. Yeah. And I'm looking at this scorpion salt on pasta. Yeah. Please elaborate. (laughs) So, (laughs) so, uh, uh, the sour salt inspired me like, okay, that was, we were going to make that kind of like the elemental series. So elements being uh, the elements of taste being sour, sweet, umami, uh, spicy, salty, spicy is not really one of those things, but I was kind of thinking more liberally. So I was like, I want something that does that same thing as the sour salt, but just for spiciness. And so what's the most evocative chili pepper in the world in terms of its name, maybe ghost pepper, but I think scorpion chili is even just cooler. It's just super okay. cool chili with a cool history. And, um, I love heat. And so it's just like, this is super simple. We're going to have our natural sea salt, organically going ch- chili pepper enough to scare you enough for the heat heads to love, but uh, not so much that it's going to like taste awful. Um, and it just adds that nice kick. Uh, my father-in-law is his favorite product he uses every day. And, yeah, it's, and as you can tell, one of the things that you know, we miss from looking at that, those, those pictures, for instance, is, is we're constantly trying to use the shape of our island. The shape of our island is basically our logo. And so in the center of every single one of our products, you'll see a, the shape of our island cut out. And in this case, we saw, oh, the shape of our island kind of looks like the body of a, uh, a scorpion. And so we cut my graphic designer kind of put some legs on it. And it's like, okay, here you go. This, the scorpion actually really has nothing to do with the Seattle island, but it worked and uh, we loved it. Uh, so it's kind of become one of the mainstays. So you like heat, but yeah, how hot is this I mean, on the, <laughs> in, in the? And I know some people like it; they want it so hot that they just they don't care it taste. They just want to, you know, they want the heat. But you're saying this still has this has heat and flavor. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because the thing about the scorpion okay. chili is that it's it's fruity. It's uh, oh. you smell it, you taste it. It's not just pure like rage heat. It's a uh, it's got this lovely fruitiness to it. Um, so. Yeah, a lot of my family uses this, and they're not like crazy hotheads. Um, okay, but we do have other. I mean, we have a sriracha salt, for instance, for the people that like hot things, and that's obviously spicy. We have a Thai, a, t- a spicy Thai blend. Um, so my brother's traveled all over the world, and as he travels, he kind of collects flavors and tastes from the different cuisines he visits. So some of these flavors are what we call part of the passport series. Um, because yeah, traveling is kind of like part. That's like part of his DNA. He loves it, and so he collects these ideas, these little inspirations from here and there, and then the Thai blend, the sriracha, the gamasio. We have a, a ramen seasoning coming up, uh, inspirations from places he's visited. So that'll come in little packets. <laughs> no, little big old jars. <laughs> the pack is not enough. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. You say raw is how I, yeah. I went to college. This is oh, ramen packets. Yeah, of course. You know? <laughs> yeah, me too. I still eat the packets, but, uh, yeah, oh. no, it's, uh, it's kind of coming up with a organic natural version of that. What's going on in that. And, uh, but okay. it's like, we, we but some of our seasonings you could start you can imagine we would start from what's the end use like okay this would be perfect for this like oh that's a perfect seasoning for salmon or something but much more we're just like what tastes good like we want to create seasonings that you want to snack on out of the jar which sounds weird because like we're talking about salts and seasonings like who wants to snack on a seasoning but actually a lot of our stuff is so delicious and like addictive that you're like you find yourself like ugh, spooning it out of the jar. So that's our goal. That's when we, that's when we know we've hit something good is that you want to eat it right okay. out of the jar. Um, which is a weird metric again, but so we're just like, we know we love the flavor of ramen. Like, how do they do that? How do they get that much flavor in, in that situation there? Um, so it's kind of just a kind of fun culinary puzzle to figure out how you pack that much flavor in. Um, we'll see if we can figure out the puzzle. It's not out yet, obviously. So, yeah. Okay. You've got salted honey caramels. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been a, pff, one of the biggest parts of our business. I don't know how that happened, but uh, we sell a ton of them. <laughs> really? Yeah. I guess a lot of sweet tooth in the world. I think that's the moral of that story. But uh, okay. yeah, so uh, we knew salted caramels. It's like, okay, you have sea salt. We have to figure out what we're going to do with all this sea salt because we're making thousands of pounds of it a year. So, okay, what can we do with it? We can put it in seasonings. Oh, what else can we do with it? And okay, salted caramels. Um, okay. And again, a concurrent with all this I didn't mention yet is it concurrent with me becoming a salt farmer. I also became a beekeeper. That was much more on the amateur level. I never kept more than about 20 or 30 hives, but okay. So salt and honey were constantly running through my brains. So these are like the two coolest products. I know I can, I know they're both amazing. They both kind of like inspire my spirit to make them. So I was like, okay, can we make a caramel with honey 
using our sea salt, thinking about this, because the thing about caramels is almost all caramels in the world are made with corn syrup. That's kind of the base thing that they're using. Mm -hmm. Um, We're like, okay, can we replace that corn syrup with honey? And then that's where my brother comes in and just uses his magic. I mean, he developed his, his own recipe because to make a honey caramel is honey is different than corn syrup. It behaves differently while you cook it. It has all sorts of different properties. So anyway, he developed this thing over months and months and months. And, uh, we've been selling them for about five, six years now and three different flavors right now. We're going to add a fourth this year and yeah, they've been a great, great seller for us. So he's become kind of accidentally fallen into becoming kind of a, what would you call it? I can't, a, a patissier. He's like, he's developed these really uh, fine tuned skills for exactly the right temperature to bring this thing to and how long exactly to hold it to get that perfect caramel. So, yeah. So you said you had three. So you got the salted honey, you've got the caramel salted honey and the cappuccino salted uh, honey. chocolate. Yeah. We got chocolate, the regular chocolate. and the cappuccino. Yeah. So, and you said there's a fourth one. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're not exactly sure. We got a couple different options, but there'll definitely be a fourth one coming out this year. Um, awesome. Yeah. It's this time of year, you know, we're a, a, for a foodie business, like for many retail businesses, December, November, December, like that's when you make all your sales and then things just kind of slow way down. And so January, February, March is when we start being creative again. Um, yeah, November, December is just like do everything you can to just keep going and don't survive, yeah, survive. Exactly. And then you can breathe a little bit and then the creative juices start flowing again. Yeah. Okay. And then your honey, you guys sell honey as well. Yeah, we sure do. Yeah. Now it looks like, so I'm on this. So I see San Juan Island yeah. honey, and, and then I see upper left. honey. Yeah. So the San Juan's yours, that's right? Correct. From exactly your right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And upper left is stuff that you're finding. You're sourcing on other beekeepers. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we we immediately okay. when we started the San Juan Sea Salt business, I started making honey. Um, it turns out it's way harder to make honey than it is to make sea salt. Sea salt is like it's almost formulaic. As long as the sun's shining, you put the seawater in there a month later or so, it's going to turn into salt. Not much can go wrong with that. You can have leaks in your pond. That's one thing that goes wrong. But it's kind of like this. It's very almost mechanical in a way. Beekeeping is more like alchemy. It's like. It, I mean, hives are these amazing confluences of all this evolutionary learned behavior and then the, how I'm, what I'm bringing to it and then whatever their environment is and what the weather is doing and how many flowers are blooming at the right time and how that queen is producing. It's a way more fussy process. And so it's just harder to, harder to make, harder to scale, harder to do. So we would make very small amounts of it. Like we're talking like 500 pounds a year. I mean, it's truly good stuff, light, delicate, just beautiful wildflower honey. But um, I realized it was... <laughs> it didn't make any sense for me to try to scale this up because there's not many flowers in the island. It's a small place, not many, not much farming is happening here. Um, and we were buying all this honey for our caramels. So we're buying like hundreds and hundreds of gallons of, of honey for our caramels from this local beekeeper in Mount Vernon. And we're like, well, maybe we can just, we're going to come up with another brand of honey, upper left honey, where we can source from other Northwest Washington beekeepers. So they're all from Washington, all, you know, almost all doing the same stuff we're doing, which is wildflower honey. Um, and uh, getting good raw honey and selling it on to our customers. But then, of course, we w- one of the things we haven't mentioned yet is we, we smoke our salt, and that's one of our most popular products. But then we're like, oh, wait, we, can, we smoke our salt. Maybe we can smoke our honey, too. So, yeah, we got, we're got we using our – yeah, that's an interesting one. <laughs> you're, you're giving what? me a face, yeah. Yeah, for those of you who can't see us, my head is kind of, yes. what? Smoked honey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, – so my brother, in that addition sounds... to being the, the candy maker, he's also like a pit master because he has all these big in, uh, industrial smokers we use to smoke our sea salt, which is a, you know, it's a cool process in and of itself. And we smoke it with madrona wood. So for those that don't know madrona, it's kind of like this iconic Washington tree, um, beautiful red bark. It looks unlike all the, the, the evergreens around here. It's just, I mean, it stands yeah. out like a sore thumb. Um, Very distinct. Yes. And so I knew we wanted to smoke with a wood I'd never seen used as smoking wood. Because, you know, in the South, they got mesquite and you got, even you can smoke with cherry wood and maple and all the rest. So I was like, we want to use the Washington, for me, as a Washington tree, the Madrona. And uh, so we started smoking the salt and it came out great. It's a different kind of flavor than you would get from just smoking off pellets or whatever. And uh, and then, yeah, we tried smoking the honey and it kind of is like barbecue sauce. I mean, it's amazing. And all it is is honey. But it's been infused with this Madrona smoke. And, uh oh. So again, it's like we started out with this thing. We're making sea salt, but then, as businesses often do, you find little eddies in the whirlpool of your, uh, in the stream of your business where you're heading off and do something else, and it, it people love it and it's profitable. And so, yeah, we've making a smoked honey and the caramels and all the rest as kind of offshoots of our core business. Let's talk about smoking then. Um, how do you smoke honey? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I'm like, how? 
Yeah, help me out here. <laughs> I, I'm struggling with a visual yes. here. I, I, yes. I can't. I can't visualize. That's totally fine. Um, so with like with most parts of our business, you don't have to be very. It's like it's not super complex. Imagine a big old pit smoker. Like you'd have like a rack of ribs on. So it's what they call an offset smoker. So the the wood is in a compartment to the side of the smoker. You're not actually having active flames and heat underneath your product. Um, so over on the side is the Madrona wood. It's gently smoking out of whatever perfect temperature my brother's found. And then just inside the smoker are these big pans. So we're talking like uh, like what would it be like aluminum foil pans? You put like a bunch of food at a picnic in, you put the honey in there. It, it's just absorbing, absorbing, absorbing all that smoke. And it's in the air after about two days, we run that through a filter to get any of the smoke pieces out. And it's smoky honey. It's deliciously mad- smoke, smoky honey. That's been infused with that flavor of Madrona wood. And then for the salt, is it similar yeah. where you use the aluminum pans as well? Uh, okay. It's a slightly different thing, but yeah, same idea. I mean, it's, it's just letting, yeah, letting them sit around smoke. Um, just like you smell, like when you sit by a campfire and you smell smoky, right. it's no different than that. Um, but yeah, we try to capture that essence of that beautiful Madrona tree and, and, uh, transfer it onto the honey, transfer it onto the salt. And I think I read that you guys are sourcing your Madrona by picking up, um, dis- not discarded, but if the tree has dropped a limb or something, you're not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, the first five or six years, boy, I think we were just, just beg, borrow and steal, try to find fallen Madrona trees because they're not. Madrona is not something you can like go to Home Depot and I'd like a, a, a stick of Madrona. No. That's not how that works. Um, but what happens often around here is there'll be some fancy new house built on the rocks or whatever. And it's part of that process, they're cutting down these things. And so by hook or by crook, we get access to that stuff that got cut down or, you know, off, right. or, but right. of course a big windstorm will do the same thing. So, yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Well, what haven't we covered? I would say just, it's not happening yet, but to, get, to give you a sense for what the dream for what we're going to be with our business is imagine a winery for sea salt. Um, so you go to a winery because it's fun to see how something's made to talk to a craftsperson, to see something beautiful and to do some tastings, you know, to taste the product. Um, so our big dream is to become kind of a, a winery for sea salt on the Island here, a destination, a must visit destination where you come, I kick you on a tour. I teach you about how we make salt, the science of salt, the, the way that our salt is unique. You sit in a beautiful spot, you have a glass of wine, you taste some snacks with our salts on them and you go away, happy customer. Um, and I share a little bit of that, yeah. that magic of the Island. So it's non trivial thing. You know, the San Juan, San Juan Islands real estate market is extremely hot as is Seattle and everything else, but uh, a lot of rich people buying stuff up, but regardless, I feel like, I feel like it's an achievable goal. And I, I, I want to share more of what we do because it brings me a lot of magic and uh, I want to share that with people. So just keep an eye on us. Uh, we're we're going to try to make it happen. We're going to keep making more products and uh, come up to the farmer's market, visit us, uh, you know, say hi to us. The farmer's market will probably be my, me or my brother there. And uh, uh, okay. yeah, say hi. Well, besides the farmer's market, where else can people find your products? Uh, lots of retailers. So uh, lots of, what do you call them? Like gourmet specialty shops throughout Washington and beyond. Um, a few co-ops. So not, not any grocery store, not any big grocery store chains yet. Um, but some larger co-ops like in Bellingham, Port Townsend, um, Seattle, the central co-op has it. But really to get our full source, to get the full breadth of what we offer, the only place is the website. Because right now we have about 30 or 40 products and any one given store will only carry maybe say five or 10 of those at most. Um, right. Yeah. So to get the full experience, come to our website. We offer free shipping on every order uh, nationwide. So it's, there's no big ship shipping fee and uh, we got tons of fun stuff to try. Well, I think when we talked on the phone before we recorded this episode, I was telling you that uh, a vendor that I use for our email is a, com- is a company called convert. Yeah. And they're out of Boise. Yeah. Boise. Idaho. Yeah. And the owner of the company has a newsletter where he's talking marketing. Yeah. And I, you guys were on our list of people we wanted to talk to. Okay. So it wasn't what we, we'd already reached out to you the first time. And then I saw this yeah. email and he was gushing over his wife had ordered some of your products. And he's like, I don't know that I've seen something as nicely packaged with as much information. It was, it was, it was amazing what these, how these were presented to us, you know, in the mail. And so I was just like thinking, well, this is kind of cool that this guy who's big into marketing and sees all sorts of yeah. stuff is is calling out you guys for doing such an exemplary job of presenting your product. So kudos to you for yeah. that. And uh, no, this is this is very interesting. I mean, I'm 
I'm still scratching my head about some things, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave me wanting more. I, I think it's awesome though that you guys have found a way to create jobs for yourselves and other people on the island. That's kind of a tough, tough thing in this world is to, you know, a lot of places like that, you go away, you don't come back until you're yeah. older, you know, and you, your, your prime earning years, you, you're in Seattle, yes, let's that's say, right. you know, that's right. and then, and then you come back. And, and so this is awesome that you're, you're, you're able to be on the Island and, and raise your family there and all that. And do the kids love living on the Island? I mean, was it fun as a little kid to grow up? Oh, there? I loved it. Absolutely. Some, some yeah. I mean, it, not, it wasn't that way for everybody. Some people were miserable, but you know, I think a lot of people who are miserable are going to be miserable anywhere. But for me, I don't know. It was just a small community that just like lifted us up. Like, <sighs> you know, on every level from the, from your sports events to anything you do, you're going to get the community's going to try to lift you up. And that, and that was true of this business. I mean, cause I was an Island boy. And so he's this, here's this Island boy starting this business. I mean, this community for a number of years, they were just like, most of my sales were family and friends and community members. And, uh, just that feeling of a community that knows each other, let alone, I mean, just some of the most magical landscapes that Washington has to offer all on this one Island. It's for me, it was, I couldn't imagine growing up anywhere else. And I feel really blessed to be able to raise my kids here and, um, you know, do a unique job while doing, I think we kind of hit the jackpot working this job that makes us not just happy, but kind of like inspires us to, you know, keep going and learning more and, and serving our customers. So yeah, I feel really lucky. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for being on. This is fun. I always love talking to businesses and hearing, hearing your stories. And I, I think it's, I, even though I don't want to make salt, that's not why I'm, I, you know, but I enjoy hearing about, you know, I enjoy hearing about the processes of all these companies because I just personally find it fascinating yeah. and I'm glad you're doing what you're doing and I wish you all the best. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the chance of being on. All right. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.